Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the 2019 drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is home ownership consultant Ross K from the wealthy homeowner.ca. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Hey, thanks for having me back on, Jim. Ross, let's get right to the stats or data, as you like to say. You've asked us to follow Calgary to learn how housing stats mislead the public. You said November would be a negative month in sales after months of positive sales spin. What happened in Cowtown? <laughs> what happened in Calgary? Exactly what we were telling everyone on the show throughout the summer and uh, the early fall. When those additional 100 sales that were entered into the sales chain way back in June and July finally were exhausted in October, in other words, the trade-up sales that followed through from those simple addition of 100 extra first-time buyers were gone, exhausted in October. That meant the Calgary Real Estate Board reported increase in sales June, July, August, September, October, and magically in November, sales year over year for November were negative. You really can't make this stuff up, Jim. The real estate boards were, bra the real estate board of Calgary was bragging about sales gains of 10%, about the housing market stabilizing. At the same time, people were being laid off in Calgary. They were telling people, now is a good time to buy. They were broadcasting it as a buyer's market. We don't define a buyer's market when house prices are falling and the eventual outcome of a few additional sales is going to be exhausted. We say that's a market you should not be buying into. There are technically, Jim, very few markets where you should be buying into, but none of them are defined by how organized real estate, Canadian banks, CMHC, measures a housing market. Everyone measures a housing market using real estate that, which we just debunked from Calgary. They did not see an additional 10% sales gain in October. That is a falsehood, a myth, a scam, a con. In October, they simply had an additional 100 sales get reported as the final sales that began way back in June. So what we have said on the show came true. This is not magic. This is not being uh, a savant, this is not about knowing something that everyone else studying a housing market should know. This is simply how a housing market functions. It's how they operate. It's how the public has been deceived for 40 years. That's a long time for uh, false information to be uh, propagated and believed. Ross, why are your numbers different than what real official real estate puts out? Well, first of all, Jim, when we look at our numbers, we are comparing looking at the global housing market or the universe of housing sales in Canada. Those universe of housing sales have never been reported. Not only do we look at the universe, in other words, every home that's selling in the country, trading hands, we're also adjusting those numbers to be sure that we're measuring them properly. The most ridiculous thing that you're ever going to hear is someone who compares year-over-year year monthly housing sales. The reason you can't do that is one one month, one year, there could be 14, or excuse me, uh, 24 reporting days in a month, and then the following year, in the exact same month, there could be 22 reporting days. That is, in that instance, two out of 22 is almost a 10% increase in the year where there was 24%, 24 reporting days. So we have to adjust for that. If one real estate board counts a sale and another real estate board reports the exact same property selling a second time in the same month, we eliminate that and count that as one sale. 
if a property sells and is reported by one real estate board in one month and is subsequently reported, reported as sold in another real estate board in another month, that sale is removed. If the sale is reported in multiple real estate boards over multiple months, we reduce all of that into one, the place where the the, the, the home was originally listed, its home real estate board, in the month that originally sold. We take the MLS rules and regulations for the resale market, and we apply those rules and regulations to every community that we're measuring, which is the national housing market. There's technically 69 sets of rules that you need to apply against real estate uh, transactional data. In the new homes market, we're measuring that market totally different uh, as well. When we look at the data that is available publicly, Jim, on new home construction, Canada's mortgage debt, and then we go to do a Google search looking for one single chart that uses the data the way that we do it, it does not exist. We're looking at uh, a report from Scotia Economics from yesterday where they're talking about mortgage debt. So this is uh, it's authored by Brent House, the VP and Dep- Deputy Chief Economist of Scotiabank. Canada mortgage growth keeps accelerating is the headline. Canadian mortgage credit accelerated in October to its fastest monthly pace since July of 2017. They're blaming this on B20 in the second statement. They're saying consumer credit growth slowed in the month, continuing a two-year trend deceleration in a year-on-year term. Now, anyone who's listened to this show for the last three years would have they would have heard us tell how consumer credit, non-mortgage, is predicated on home ownership wealth. The moment the home ownership wealth of the nation begins to decrease, consumer credit growth slows. It's not a it is not a correlation, it is a causation. It is tracked in the data from the earliest days this data was available. The the conclusion that Scotiabank, uh, VP and Deputy Chief Economist included in this report once again about B20. The mortgage pickup was driven entirely by a continu- continued rise in mortgage borrowing, which saw its fastest monthly expansion since April of 2017, a time that was well before the B20 mortgage guidelines were tightened. Doesn't go on to explain why the mortgage growth surged in the third quarter of 2019. The entire report, which if I'm not mistaken, Jim, is it's uh, four pages four pages long, but one page is a disclaimer and a waiver and a legal provision written by lawyers to allow this economist to to publish what we view as false, misleading, and inaccurate data. The entire report doesn't mention the real cause for why mortgage growth accelerated in the third quarter of 2019. 19, which was because homes that were purchased brand new builds in 2016, 2015, 2017 were closing this year. There is a lag in mortgage data when you're trying to attach it to the housing market. Yet what I just told you does not appear in any of the eight charts, nine, ten charts, that I'm looking at right now in this report. Now, you can't tell me, Jim, that we are the only organization in this country, or or for that matter, around the globe, that knows mortgage debt was accelerating and was set to um, accelerate again in the third quarter of 2019. You can't tell me we're the only people that knew that. It just defies logic. Someone else must know. We can't be the only ones unless the, the, the ignorance about real estate stats in the housing market is also part of the mortgage market understanding. Now, and that's, you're just asking too much for us to, to, to believe that that's the case. What we know, Jim, now I need to stress this for our listeners. Without mortgage debt growth, Canada will enter a recession. We said this on the show a couple of years ago. This is not a debatable item. This is not someone, something that someone could debate with us and win. Our data is irrefutable. 
our data, if the Bank of Canada, CMHC, governments, or a court of law was looking at our charts, the way that we measure housing markets and mortgage debt, a child could point to the points where you're going to see a, a change, an inflection in the data. That's how black and white these issues are. So when we're talking about telling people to go to the Calgary Real Estate Board and start checking from May forward and see where those ex, what month those extra 100 sales were, were, were reported on and how each successive month those 100 an ex, those 100 sales simply flipped into the next month on successive trades in, in a sales chain and that they would be exhausted in November, the data, even within the stats, is sitting there for you to look at. You're welcome to believe the Calgary Real Estate Board. You're welcome to believe your local real estate board. You're welcome to believe your provincial real estate board or the Canadian Real Estate Association if you so desire. You are welcome to believe a bank economist who cannot explain why third quarter mortgage debt increased when the data to support that is publicly available for free in this country for anyone to collect. What I will tell your listeners is this, Jim. We'll leave this topic on this thought. The government, governments of Canada, provincial governments, local governments, municipal governments, all of the governments have led us to this housing crisis that we're in today, where young families are being encouraged to go out and enter a home in a correcting housing market. began way back in 2004. One single chart produced from publicly available data. In other words, not even proprietary data that we have. Publicly available data shows you why from 2004 till 15 years later, we ended up where we are today. Politicians, for whatever reason, have missed this for 15 years. One chart from publicly available data should have warned every single person voted into power in this country about the problem with the housing market the problem that was going to happen. Everything could be defined from one chart. A Google search does not reveal that chart. We'll have more with Ross K. right after the break. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Ross Vancouver has released its latest sales stats. They're reporting a red hot 55% increase in sales in November. What do you see what's been announced by local real estate? What I see is more real estate talk from organized real estate. Now, what your listeners have to understand is all of the realtors who work for a real estate board are trained to believe what the real estate board tells them is true. You've got to understand, you need to sell thousands of homes over a decade in order to acquire the knowledge necessary to understand how an MLS system functions, how the home trading infrastructure functions, how the housing market functions. That is not something that is taught anywhere in Canada today. The real estate boards have the local real estate sales reps and brokers believing the new sales to listings ratio or the active sales 
or the, the sales to active listings ratio is a valid metric. Your local realtors truly believe these things to be true. Your local realtors truly believe that their local real estate board is reporting home sales and prices. They truly believe that, and that's communicated to the public. Now, for the listeners of the show here who went back and checked the publicly available, the Calgary Real Estate Board stats, you were able to track how we explained to you a simple 100 additional first-time buyers entering the market in June allowed the Real Estate Board to report 10 to 14% year-over-year monthly increases in sales. you got to remember, in months where people aren't moving as regularly, which there is some seasonality to that, you can't use a seasonally adjusted number, folks, but there is a seasonality to that. Those months, you get a bigger gain because 100 is a larger percentage of the number of homes that sell. In months where it's busier, you get a smaller gain. That's why you can't look at percentage change, which is exactly what's going to appear in Vancouver newspapers tonight. Home sales up 55%. Hogwash, you're being scammed. You're being conned. Because the people who are reporting on these numbers don't understand how a housing market works. So I'll let your listeners go to the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver, go to their stats, download their stats for the last few months, and double check and see what I'm going to tell you is correct. In July and August of this year, the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver reported an increase in sales. In June, of course... Sales were negative by a substantial margin, as they had been for months on end. July was the first positive month, where the market had bottomed and a few additional first-time buyers had entered the market. They entered the market to record an additional 800 or 487 sales. In August, because it was taking such a long time for people to buy their next home, there was an additional 302 sales that were added to the sales chain by first-time buyers. Those two months to combined reported 789 sales, new extra sales, 789. Now your market has rolled over. You've come from negative year-over-year comparisons to positive. That is the trough of your housing, uh, of your housing market. Um, I'm not going to go into any further explanation. Other than if there was 789 new first-time sales in the July-August period, I would expect to see 789 new sales be reported by the Real Estate Board in September. Unfortunately, they only reported 732 because 57 of those buyers, trade-up sales, delayed their purchase into the following month. And in October, the year-over-year change was reported as 892 as a result. We're talking within 10, 20, 30 sales difference month to month. In November, just today, remember folks, 892 reported more sold in October, 890 more in November. That's because those trade-up sales took place the following month. You have been scammed. You have been conned. You have been misled not only by organized real estate, your local real estate brokers, but the banks, the economists, and your government. You can verify this yourself on the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver data. Now, what I'm going to tell you is this. The head economist at the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver has no idea what I'm talking about. The head economist the BC Real Estate Association has no idea what I'm talking about. They can look at the numbers, and they can see 892 sales in October equals 890 more sales in November, and they'll be scratching their head. Yet a child who understands what it's like when their parent sells their home and mom and dad have to go shop for their next home or they'll be homeless has a certain understanding of what I'm talking about. Your housing market in Vancouver was not red hot. Sales have not changed. What you're seeing is the final sales of a surge in sales, a a, a new first-time buyers entering the market in July and August which followed through in September, which followed through in October, which followed through in November. It is the same scam that was pulled on Calgary home buyers. 
Where this matters is if you're buying a home because they want you to believe this. They want you to believe that the housing market is red hot or that the housing market is 55% busier or that the housing market has returned to its 10-year average, the latest fictitious metric that organized real estate has come up with. The housing market is not in Vancouver, is in no way at its 10-year average because the 10-year average needs to be calculated differently than how the real estate board calculates it. The real, the numbers you heard today from the Calgary Real Estate Board are hogwash. The excuses you're going to be told are hogwash. I put my reputation on the line as a housing market analyst, as an expert in the trading cycle, every single week I come on this show. Every single item we discuss in this show later is proven to be true. If you're a young home buyer looking to buy a home in Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, anywhere, please don't believe a realtor. Please don't believe the local real estate board. Please don't believe the Canadian Real Estate Association. Please don't believe the economist at your local bank because they all miss Calgary over the last few months. You're not going to find that in print anywhere else. They all miss Vancouver today. You're not going to see that reported in the news tonight, but you can go and check it out and see if it's true yourself. We'll have more with Ross K. right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Ross, another listener question. Hello, my fiancé and I have a question for Ross. I remember him stating in one of your past interviews that housing will adjust 43% by the time the correction is over. Their question, when will it be at the bottom? When will it be at the bottom? Okay, so that, that's going to range a long period of time. Okay, a long period of time. So I'm, I'm sorry I can't answer the question. The category of home these people are looking for, it's going to be different than other categories of home. The municipality that you're looking at is going to be different than all other municipalities. The quality of home that you're looking at is going to be totally different than the quality of home in every other municipality or market. All of those things are variables, which when aggregated together um, will result in uh, somewhere around the 43% decrease that we mentioned. Now, this is also a time function. If the inflation, Canadian inflation is at 2%, then over a five-year period, you're going to have what? About a, what's that, 12, 13, 13% uh, real price reduction take place, even if prices stay exactly the same. Generally, in a housing correction, inflation wipes out a large portion of the excess. In other words, prices stay stagnant for a long period of time while you, the, the purchasing power of your dollar is being devalued. And then years later, um, that that is uh, recorded in uh, in real world uh, price change on your home. The quality of the housing stock in general it's constantly changing. It's changing at different rates uh, at, for each different category of home in each different municipality, even neighborhood, technically speaking, in across uh, across uh, your markets. So that is another inflationary factor that we have to calculate for when we're coming up with these numbers. House price inflation itself, like the, the, the quality change in the housing stock, has never been recorded anywhere in North America. We're the only people who record that. I don't believe it's probably possible to do this anywhere else in any other country other than Canada. Um, the, the, the availability uh, of data that we have at our fingertips 
uh, today publicly accessible. And if you know how to read it and you know where to look, uh, it's, it's tremendous. So you could be wiping out another 10% of today's value seven years from now just by the change in the housing stock. What that means is that if you own a single detached home uh, and your municipality is, keeps adding condos, 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 and low, lower and sm- or smaller and smaller condos, your your house number, its its rank in the housing stock continues to go up. If you are in a one of those small condos, your rank in the housing stock continues to decrease. So those things all come into fact. So it's a complicated um, calculation in terms of the, na- the number of inputs that you have to be, uh, to be adding to come up with a real house price change in any municipality, but, it is, but it's easy. So when you know how to measure all these factors and you've collected all of this data um, and, and, and you aggregate it, you're able to come up with that. So I can't really give you an answer. What I can tell you is there are already many homes across the Vancouver area that are selling below 40% off what they were selling at peak in the peak of uh, uh, March of 2016. Okay, there already are already many homes there. If you're a social media uh, follower, there there's lots of uh, social media folks out there who do who are doing a good job reporting when they're. These, they are seeing these sales being reported, and, and and we're not talking a few folks. We're talking hundreds, of, hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, it, it is also going to cause a major problem uh, because of the way property taxes are handled in your city. So I'm not going to give you an answer on that. I'm paid to give people an answer on that, Jim. I'm I'm paid to do the calculation. Uh, we're, we're 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 paid to put your information. As a home buyer, into an algorithm and come up come up with timing for you. That timing is revised every single month that we pass. Um, but what I'll tell you is is that we're never wrong because we can't be wrong because it's math. And as I think about uh, my old math teacher saying, "It's math, stupid. You you can't be wrong as long as you do the math correctly." Ross, another listener asked, the city of Vancouver is raising property taxes by 8.2%, and if you put uh, utility fees in there, it's over 9%. Is this tax grab to compensate for the lost revenue due to dropping house prices? This listener is being fooled by your local politician and everyone else. That's what's going on here, Jim. What they're going to do is they're announcing what the average the average tax property taxes are going to change. In other words, if you owned a $600,000 property for the sake of the argument, it was valued at $600,000 last year, and it's valued at $600,000 this year, the city is going to raise your property taxes by 8.2%. Why did they have to do that, and why aren't they telling anyone the real reason? So you've got two options to this, two answers to this, this question, two options in how I'm going to answer this. Your politicians are nincompoops. They're incompetent. They're, as Joel Biden would say, they're full of malarkey. They don't know what they're talking about. Or B, they are willing to con you because of the flawed property tax assessment model they have believed was okay for decades. What's happening is your aggregate value of the housing stock in Vancouver has plummeted. When you see houses previously that are, that are selling for 40 and 50% below what they sold for in 2016, those lower selling prices are now being used by BCE value on the assessment value of neighboring properties. The same scam that was applied to tell everybody housing prices were really going up 10% a year or 40 or whatever crazy things your local real estate boards were telling you, it's the same flaw that is taking place in terms of BC assessment, which is technically delayed by almost a year. So when you've got all of these big single detached homes 
dropping in value, let's say they drop them in value only by 15%, only 15%. We know where that, where there's houses, where the, where a house sells for 40 to 50% less, all of those neighboring properties by law are going to have to see their property assessments drop almost that, that amount as well. But let's just take the 15% average. That means that the value of the housing stock in uh, Vancouver has dropped for the sake of the argument, by 15%. But that's not really what happened because those poor young Canadian home buyers who were suckered in by the government in 2017 into using that first-time buyer credit to get into the housing market will find their home hasn't dropped 15%. And if your home hasn't dropped, I'm going to argue by 8.2% in the last year, you are effectively paying for wealthy foreign owners whose property taxes are still going to be reduced by up to 20% even after with the 8.2% increase. It's simple math. If it's 100 times 8 point, an 8.2% increase, that means you pay $108.20. But if your house is only worth 90 cents, and you've got to pay an 8.2% increase, you're not even paying a dollar anymore. What the flawed property tax assessment, which we have warned on this show going way back to 2016, because we knew this was coming, you are now having, as we have said on the show several times in between 2016 and today, young Canadian families who were encouraged to enter the Vancouver housing market paying a higher tax property taxes in 2020, while at the same time wealthy foreign buyers are paying lower property taxes. The average is 8.2% rise. I will tell your listeners, I would suspect around 40% of the um, Vancouver house homeowners will pay no more or less tax this year, in 2020, than they did in 2019. 60% will pay more. The 60% will dis- be disproportionately Canadian. That percentage will be sub- of, of Canadians will be lower in the 40% who get the, de- who get the de- decrease. That means non-residents, non-Canadians will be benefiting once again. You have incompetent politicians or ignorant politicians, one or the other. If they want to think they can convince people in 2019, the days of social media, that that the, that they can get away with these property tax rises on young Canadian families in Vancouver and let the wealthy off the hook. It's not going to happen because you also have to remember this impacts tenants because tenants, generally are speaking, are living in that 60% of the housing stock where property taxes are going to have to go up to compensate for where the property taxes are dropping. Those tenants are going to see their landlords inflate their rents to make up for the money that the landlord, fair fair and square, has to pay. I mean, there's no way that the landlord should have to absorb it. Whoever's living at the house who accesses the municipal services should be the one that pays. That's my perspective. We could argue that on another day. But that's my perspective. I believe the way that you have affordable tenancy is to have an informed, engaged tenant who understands what the long-term rent profile is going to be for them over the next 10 years. And then the landlord sticks to it. The landlord is not greedy. The landlord is happy with the rate of return that they're going to get for those 10 years. Property taxes in Vancouver are going to raise more than 8.2% for those young Canadian homeowners who purchased a home believing the province and the city of Vancouver and BC that that first time home buyer bonus they were giving you was something you should use. But let's not stop there folks. Let's put the blame also with CMHC and that scam first time home buyer plan or shared equity plan that they brought out in September. Can you imagine being a young first time home buyer? who purchased a condo in September and used that scam CMHC program, shared equity. What they've done is they've sold you a house 
which they didn't qualify you to buy on these higher property taxes. These higher property taxes for some families will be the difference between having a steak once a week and eating hamburger. It will be the difference between maybe sometimes putting, be able to put gas in your car because you're also going to see a rise in your insurance rates, which is another thing that is not discussed. The reason why you need a home ownership profile done for you on any home you're considering buying is so that you know with a high degree of accuracy what your monthly costs are going to be this year, next year, the year after that, the year after that, and the year after that over the next 10 years. Those numbers are never shared with you. They're not shared with you with any calculator that you can access online. They, those calculators all give partial measures that are relevant only on the day you complete the, use the calculator. They are not forecasting using historical data all of the changes to the cost of owning a home that homeowners have experienced over the last 40 years. This property tax change is a big, big um, reveal on another ongoing misleading of the Canadian public. I wish I could say otherwise, Jim, but I can't. The city of Vancouver has not admitted that wealthy foreign, in some cases, Jim, I'm going to tell you this, in some cases, you know the empty homes tax? You know the uh, foreign buyer tax? In some cases, the, the, the property tax reduction that is going to take place in 2020 will offset those costs totally. All of the things they told you about how this was going to work out are going to be debunked. The only sad thing is it takes about five years for anyone to realize what really went on the same way that it took 2017, 2018, 2019, and only beginning in 2020 will those families be impacted by rising property taxes for new Canadian home buyers while wealthy foreign owners get a reduction. Ross, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me on, Jim. My guest has been home ownership consultant Ross K from the wealthy homeowner.ca. If you have any questions for Ross, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Find us on Twitter at House Street. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.